Shane's back with you once again, and I guess this debt ceiling thing, uh, this whole debate, I guess it's in the books now, isn't it? It looks like uh, it's just waiting for the ink to dry. Uh, a magnificent compromise has been reached in the Congress, and I guess this is on to Obama for his approval uh, and for his signature. And uh, quite frankly, this thing is going into law to the satisfaction of practically nobody. Uh, you would have a hard time finding 10 people who would tell you that this is a good bill. Uh, now, granted, if you polled 100 people and asked them why they did not like this bill and, and uh, this whole compromise, you'd likely get a, a wide range of answers on, on why that is, both from liberals and conservatives alike. They both hate it for some drastically different reasons. But I'll go ahead and tell you right now why I dislike the bill, why I oppose the bill, and why I think it's a very negative thing. First of all, first and foremost, and, and this will come to no surprise to any of you who have listened to my last couple of programs, in my estimation, this bill, this compromise, this raising of the debt ceiling, does absolutely nothing to address the real problem that we have. It does absolutely nothing to address the reason why we're having this debate in the first place. And that reason is because for the last hundred years, we in America have spent an awful lot of money, a good amount of which we did not have and had therefore had to borrow. We spent an awful lot of money to fund a government that we largely did not need. The whole thing comes down to that. You heard me say it last week. We need to admit our mistakes of the 20th century we need to redefine what government is in a very narrow context and then cut everything that does not fit that new narrow definition of government. This bill did not even come close to doing that. So that's the basic reason why I'm against it. One of the first things I have a problem with is that, yes, it did raise the debt ceiling. I did not want that to happen. Now, I never bought into the idea that if we didn't raise the debt ceiling, we'd have some kind of financial Armageddon today. I never thought that would be the case. But the bottom line is, Raising our debt ceiling again would be equivalent to giving a heroin addict another hit or giving an alcoholic another drink of booze. It does nothing to solve the problem. It only exacerbates it. So first things first, I wanted the debt ceiling frozen right where it was. Didn't really think that would happen, but that's what I wanted. That being said, I might have been able to accept some sort of a raise in the debt ceiling if I had some kind of assurance that there was a concerted effort and a concerted uh, amount of work and a concerted am amount of action that would prevent the debt ceiling from ever being raised again in the future. In other words, if I was confident that, okay, they're going to raise it, but it's going to be the last time because we're going to make some substantial cuts and we're going to reduce government and we're going to reduce some taxes and we're going to get this country back where it needs to go, you know what, I, you might have been able to get me to agree to that. Nothing of the sort happened. Nothing at all. Now, Republican leadership is trying to put as good of a spin on this as they can. They're running around saying, hey, we got real cuts in the budget. We've got, for the first time in forever, we've gotten Democrats to actually commit to making some kind of cuts in the budget. And that's a landmark day in America. Did we really? When you look at the bill, from what I understand of it, there are no real cuts that are set in stone in the bill itself. All the cuts are effectively deferred to this 12-person committee or super congress, as some people call it, super congress, doesn't that give you a weird and disturbing image of Harry Reid running around in, in tights and a cape? <clears throat> anyway, this whole super congress thing that's going to determine somewhere down the line uh, what kind of cuts we're going to have and what they're going to be, and if they can't come to an agreement, then there's automatic triggers in there and so forth. So really, for all of this debate and all of this argument, our esteemed lawmakers who are supposed to decide such things really did not uh, make any decisions on cuts at all. They just kind of got a ballpark of what they wanted out there. Oh, I'll cut this amount. We're not going to tell you how to do it, really. Uh, so no, no real leadership there. And, and frankly, in my opinion, it was one of that. That particular point of it is one of the most gutless legislative ploys I've ever seen in my lifetime, from both parties. I mean, both parties have to be held to account for that. Um, nobody wanted to go on record as cutting anything in particular, it seemed like to me. And I know why they did it. We all know why they did it. So the Democrat or Republican, whoever they are, 
that at election time they can go back to their district and say, hey, I voted in favor of cutting spending. I voted for fiscal responsibility. And then if some of their constituents come up and say, yeah, but thus and so was cut, one of my favorite programs, they can then say, well, well that, that, wasn't, that wasn't me. That, that was the committee. That was a super Congress. My God, what a way to hedge your bets. Can you get more gutless? I mean, pardon my French, but any congressman, any senator that voted for that, the whole group of you, you're a bunch of pussies. If you can't go on the record and say, here's what we need to do and here's how we need to do it, then you're no leader at all. And then on to the idea of tax, uh, of tax increases, everybody's saying, hey, well, we got the big thing, there's no tax increases in here. And you know the Democrats, all they wanted was to increase taxes. Well, that's true, all they wanted was to increase taxes on the wealthy, no question about that. But this super Congress does have the ability to slip some taxes in there. What? You didn't know that? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, Harry Reid even said it himself today. I'm going to quote from, from Mr. Reid here. <clears throat> we look forward to the work on the committee to make sure that millionaires and billionaires and corporate jet owners and people who have those yachts who get tax benefits oil companies who get these huge tax subsidies, that this, in the mix of thinking, what goes on, that's what this select committee is going to be about. Really. So you heard it in the broken English that he put out there. This is all about taxing the wealthy. Obama's going to get exactly what he wanted. Now, maybe it's not a raise in the tax rate on the wealthy. Big freaking whoop. They're going to go after the loopholes and the tax, or what they call loopholes, and the various ways that they can get more revenue out of the rich. That's what this has been about all along. You gave Obama exactly what he wanted. Oh, but we didn't raise the tax rates. Big whoop. Now, you and I both know that if you, at the end of this year, or end of next year, whatever, if you write out a check to the IRS, and it's a higher amount than you wrote out before, you really don't care how the math was done. You really don't care if that happened because your tax rate went up or because you didn't get some deductions or however the hell it happened. You paid more money than you did last year. That is a tax increase, no matter how you fudge the math. So guess what? Higher taxes are coming. The Democrats got what they wanted, and they're going to get their pound of flesh from the rich. Gee, thanks, Mr. Boehner. Way to go. Way to help screw up our job creation, Mr. Banner. You did a hell of a job. But, for all of the consternation over this thing, if you would hear the media, and you would hear some people on the left, you would think, by listening to them, that we on the right, we in the Tea Party, somehow got some kind of magnificent victory out of all of and in fact, a lot of them, even, even John Stewart, the patron saint of the left at this point in time, a lot of them have questioned why we're not acting like we won. They're like, hey, you won and you're complaining. What the hell? Did we truly win anything? I'll tell you this. Everybody's saying we won, but it damn sure doesn't feel like it. Now, I kind of pointed out why, because the bill does nothing of what we actually wanted. It, it made no significant moves in terms of ending this crisis or or putting it in, into perspective, or to uh, put us in a situation where we could avoid it ever again. It did nothing like that. All it did was punt a lot of decisions to some super Congress committee. In fact, it wasn't even a good punt. It was like a punt that goes off the side of your foot and goes out of bounds at the 45-yard line. It was a bad punt. It was a shank. So we see through it. We know exactly what it was. But yet, the members of the media and a lot of people on the left are interpreting this as a win for the Tea Party. And the reasoning that they're saying that is because, well, you know, if it weren't for the Tea Party, these type of things would have never been discussed. I mean, in the past, all of these debt ceiling raises, they just sort of happened and nobody really even had a debate over it. It was just sort of a formality. Well, they are correct, our critics are. They are correct when they uh, point out that a lot of this debate would not have happened if not for us, and that is true. But they're characterizing that as a victory, and we're really not, because to us there's a bigger picture. You see, the people that are saying that about us, the media, the left, and even some in the Republican leadership, 
You've got to understand that these people look at everything through the prism of political power and everything through the prism of who wins an election versus who doesn't. So in their minds, they're looking at what we did and they're saying, hey, the Tea Party is now more represented in American politics. The Tea Party had an impact in this debate, which is true, we did. And now the Tea Party is better positioned to have a say in American politics. And yeah, that's true. I'm not going to argue that. But you see, what they don't understand is that for us, this has never been about political power. This has never been about winning an election. This has never been about getting some artificial number of R's versus D's in Congress or getting an artificial number of Tea Partiers in there just to say that we have more of them than you have of your side. It's never been about that. And I think that's what they don't understand. They're looking at this situation where we forced a debate to happen that, frankly, the rest of Washington never wanted to happen, where we did have an impact on what America thought about this topic, where we did at least move our own leadership to, to at least have to explain some things, even though we didn't get the bill we wanted. They look at that, and, and if you're a Democrat, if you're a mainstream Republican, or if you're a member of the media, you would love to be able to do that. That would make your day. That would be the biggest thing in the world to you. Because inside the Beltway, that's what everything comes down to. It's who has the power and who doesn't. We took a little bit of that vaunted political power, and they're wondering why it's not a big deal to us. Guys, it's not a big deal to us because it's about much more than that. We are thinking long term. We are thinking about the future of our country. Most of us could not care less how many of us win an election or how long we're in power or any of that other crap. Man, all you guys in Washington, you can keep that. We don't want it. All we want is to save the damn country. That's what this is about. So, I think you can credit the Tea Party and the right for at least moving the ball a little bit here, but I don't think you can say we won anything, at least not in the way that we're, that we're viewing the win. You know, if, if all we wanted was political power, then yeah, I guess we won. But we want to solve this problem. In that perspective, nobody won. Let's look at it this way. Since football season is coming up, a lot of media types, a lot of people on the left are saying and are looking at this as though the Tea Party has won the Super Bowl in the last couple of days. I would tell you that through this debate, the Tea Party and the right did not win the Super Bowl. We did not even win a football game. We merely got a first down. We merely gained 10 yards and got four more plays. That's all. What we want to do is so much more than just this. It's so much more than just getting political power. What we want to do is to make some very drastic and positive changes in this nation. What we want to do is to drastically reduce government. Not just reduce spending, reduce government reduce our dependence on government, reduce the oversight that we get from government, reduce the government involvement in darn near everything that's out there. That's what this is about. And I don't know that a lot of people on the left or in the media have ever truly understood that until just now. I don't know that they've ever truly grasped how much that we want to reduce or deconstruct government. I don't know until now that they truly grasped the inherent distrust we have for the very concept of government itself. Not just for Obama's government, not just for the Democrats in government, not even just for the inside the beltway mentality of government. I mean the concept of government itself. We believe, now I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I'll tell you this much, I believe and I believe that a lot of other Tea Partiers are with me on this. I believe that we have put, as a nation, have put way too much faith in the concept of government over the last hundred years. And as I pointed out in the last episode, that faith that we put in government 
not only has been burdensomely expensive, not only has wasted a lot of money, but frankly, it has been massively unsuccessful at solving the problems and achieving the tasks that we set before it. It did not end poverty like we hoped it would. It did not educate you know, the masses as though we hoped that it would. It did not equalize everybody's outcome or opportunity as some hoped that it would. All it did was play a very expensive game of charades. That's it. So there is where we're coming from on it. You know, the one thing, the one thing that, that has burned in my mind with this whole debate, this whole last three weeks, time and again we would hear politicians and commentators and people in the media say, you know, every time that the debt ceilings come up for debate before, it's just been a formality, and, and why can't why can't the Tea Party just let that happen? Why, you know, this has always been allowed to happen. Why not now? You see, that's the problem. It's that nonchalant attitude towards the borrowing of money. It's that nonchalant attitude towards the funding of government. It's that nonchalant attitude towards the very concept of government itself that we are rebelling against. That's the problem. And everybody said that we held America hostage. We did not. You know, if, if, if and when America goes through a financial meltdown, it will not be because we or anybody else did not allow a debt ceiling to be raised. Instead, it will be because since 1960, that debt ceiling has been raised 72 and now 73 times. It is the long-term pattern of borrowing and spending to finance a government that we largely do not need. That is is why a financial meltdown is possible, perhaps even probable. And this compromise, this bill, did absolutely nothing to assuage that. Did we win? Politically, I guess. But as a nation, nobody won. We understand that. And you better believe, those of you in the Republican leadership, who shows an, showed an amazing lack of guts. Those of you in the Democratic leadership who have been off your rocker for years to begin with, all of you had better realize that we are not going away and that this is consistent. And you're going to have to have this debate. That, you know, that, that hell that you went through for the last three or four weeks debating this, you are going to have to have this debate every single time it goes up going forward. You're going to have to have this debate in 2012. You're going to have to have this debate on every big congressional issue that comes up. We're not going away, and I think that if there is a silver lining from this, and it's a small silver lining, I think that everybody else in politics now thoroughly understands that. Is that positive? I guess it is in a small sense, but folks, there's still a hell of a lot of work to do. We just got a first down. We didn't win the game. That's where we stand. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.